morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on unlocking the potential of data in the light of early lessons from COVID-19. And we're extremely grateful to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control for having put together this session and brought us all together for this very interesting topic. Um, it is just after dawn here in Oxford, and I'm looking forward to a new dawn of data in our response to COVID-19. And I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion. My name is Nick Fahey. I'm a researcher here at the University of Oxford, and I'll be moderating today's session. We have an excellent uh, lineup of panelists. We're going to do the session in two halves. We're going to focus initially um, on the institutions who have been facing the challenge of how best to use data in response to the challenge of COVID-19. Um, and then in the second part of the panel, we'll be hearing about some of the national experiences and some of the specific solutions to the real challenges of collecting and using data in this, um, in this uh, situation. Because it has been a real challenge. We're, we're so used to having data at our fingertips, finding out about you know, how long it's going to take us to travel somewhere, whether we're booking something or monitoring new events. And we're very used to established data systems for diseases. But a new disease has meant new monitoring systems. And for many people outside health, this is probably the first time they've been listening to the radio or watching the television every day, waiting for the latest figures on COVID-19. And sometimes those figures haven't quite all added up or there's been con um, controversy about what they've meant and where they've come from and how well we can compare them. And that's been a challenge in the management of the pandemic. So we're going to talk today as we uh, in certainly in Europe with we're seeing this. Uh, I, I don't know if I should call it a second wave, but certainly rising incidents in Europe after the initial control of the virus and that brings to the surface again this challenge of data, a challenge that will be reinforced by perhaps other conditions that we normally experience during winter also becoming more prevalent. So um, I'm going to, initially I think um, I'm going to just, uh, just bear with me one second to ask the uh, panelists to show our introductory video from the commission. Earlier this week, the world passed a grim, agonizing milestone with the loss of more than one million lives from COVID-19. It took only nine months to reach this heartbreaking figure. These are not just numbers. Behind every number, there was a person. And behind every person, there was a story. And there is a family. We need to learn the lessons from this crisis and help to ensure it doesn't happen again. This is exactly the purpose of this session, and I want to thank the Gastein Forum and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control for organising this important discussion. The EU's response to COVID-19 has revealed gaps in our health systems and gaps in our health preparedness and response. It has also highlighted the importance of coordinated EU action to overcome these challenges. Since the beginning of the crisis, we have been working with member states to bolster health capacities. The EU vaccine strategy, the joint procurements for medical countermeasures, and the distribution of personal protective equipment and medicines are examples of this effort. We have activated the emergency support instrument to provide financial assistance to cross-border health care to purchase and deliver remdesivir to member states and to ensure advanced purchase agreements for vaccines when they are ready and proven safe and effective. We have put forward a paradigm shifting EU for Health program to work with member states to improve our preparedness and response to health crisis and to support the resilience of health systems. From day one of the pandemic, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control has played a fundamental role in our response, providing up-to-date information, important risk assessments, and valuable guidance, including on COVID-19 at workplaces, on medically and socially vulnerable schools, groups, and in schools. 
And I want to thank everyone at the agency for all the support and hard work. Through collaboration, we have achieved a significant amount, but the truth is that we need a real, effective, strengthened European Health Union that can support member states rapidly and effectively in times of crisis. This requires a larger EU budget for health, stronger EU agencies, and a stronger, more European framework for cooperation against public health threats. In the coming months, we will make a proposal to strengthen the ECDC, to improve its coordination capacities, and to reinforce its mandate to respond to health crises. In parallel, we are working on proposals to revise the legislation on cross-border health threats. This will provide us with a more robust mandate for coordination of preparedness and response. The pandemic has shown the importance of sharing regular, reliable and comparable data gathered from national surveillance systems. However, gaps in these surveillance systems have hindered the provision of reliable and comparable analysis of the epidemiological situation. We must urgently work together towards a common approach and common standards to harmonize surveillance systems and include innovative digital solutions for comparable data, all of which will enable evidence-based decision-making. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for letting me taking part in this important discussion. Together, we can establish a more efficient, robust, and standardized surveillance system. And this is the foundation upon which an effective, coordinated, and science-based European Health Union will be built. Thank you. It's a very well-timed contribution from the Commissioner, as well as a very helpful one. Um, so co the Commissioner has set out, uh, Commissioner Kyriakides has set out a, uh, a range of challenges there. Um, let me first ask, before I introduce our, our distinguished panelists, let me first ask a question to our audience here today. So uh, we're going to use the Wisembly word cloud, and you can put in one word, and that one word is going to be an answer to the question, in order to coherently manage the COVID-19 pandemic at the global and at the European level, what would be the mo most important indicator or data to collect. So in order to coherently manage the COVID-19 pandemic at the global and uh, European level, bearing in mind the issues that the Commissioner has raised around comparability, around innovative digital solutions, what would be the most important indicator to collect? And you can use the Wisembly facility to enter your words. So we're getting uh, capacity and testing very quickly. So I'm going to, you can join, you have the join instructions at the top there, app.wisembly.com, keyword EHFG 2020 S13 for session 13. And we're going to uh, feed in. So what's your one word answer to the most important indicator or data to collect? And already we get, uh, I, I see that someone has uh, managed to get cross country as a single word. I suppose that's a single word. If you put, it, if you put in uh, more than one word, it splits them, you see. So uh, you know, someone, someone knows that and has used the system very well. Testing is still up there as one of the most important. What's the most important thing? Testing capacity, capacities. Trends, now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? So less the over, the absolute levels, but more the trends. Incidence is, uh, is bubbling up. We'll give this another minute or so. Mortality expertise is the most important indicator to collect. Well, by far and away, the strongest word that's coming across there. So we see incidents, we see testing, we see variations on cross country. We've got issues there around the social gradient. 
And if we now turn to our panelists, I think that these are all issues that they are going to want to address. So we've had our contribution um, from Commissioner Stella um, Kyriakides, but we now turn to two of the agencies at global and at European level um, who have had the, uh, the greatest, who have been facing this challenge front and center. Um, from the World Health Organization, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is Executive Director of the WHO Emergencies Program. Good morning, Mike. Um, and uh, from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, Dr. Andrea Ammon, um, who is the Executive Director of the agency and to whom we owe particular thanks for having brought together the initiative for this session. Um, I will, I'll start at the global level. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to, uh, to Dr. Ryan first. This has been a challenge on so many levels, Mike. It's been a challenge of response, obviously, but the countries have been struggling even to understand the character of what it is they've been facing and, and the role that, what data they need in order to properly respond to this. What are the key challenges that you've seen and how's the WHO helped in addressing those? Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it, it, you're, you're very right. And uh, in, in, in the, in the public health sphere, many of the people listening will know that uh, data by itself uh, is really of no value. And part of our problem is not having data. Part of our problem is not having the right data. Part of our problem is not being able to analyze that data effectively. And part of the problem is not being able to turn that data into information for action, be that by policymakers, by public health practitioners, or by the public. So the problem isn't data per se. The problem is the way in which we so source, uh, collate, manage, and use that data. And in a pandemic, what the added to that is the fact that there's new data and new information every day. The situation evolves. It's not a static situation. So you're not trying to measure a static target. Uh, you're, you're, you're trying to shoot a moving target at the same time. So uh, so there's a dynamic uh, angle to that, and that puts any systems, all systems, uh, under pressure. And it, 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 it reflects to an extent how good those systems were before. Were they designed? Uh, Sir Liam Donaldson once said to me when I was based in Pakistan fighting polio, uh, he once said to me, you know, your system delivers exactly what you designed it to deliver. So stop complaining. You know, in other words, if you don't get the data that you need, then you're not collecting it properly. You're not, you know, so in other words, don't blame the data. You need to look at how we're doing the business. Uh, yeah. Yeah. More data is not a solution. So, and I think that's been faced by everybody, right? Both the afferent mm -hmm. part of the process, taking the data in and the efferent part in pushing data out as usable information. Uh, and then in the middle of all that, we have an infodemic of misinformation and disinformation, and that's data too. So. That's the context. Um, in general, in, in the experience so far, countries that have experienced frequent epidemics and have had a recent experience of a high impact epidemic tend to have put in place a lot of systems around detecting cases, making sure that lab systems are integrated with clinical systems, make sure both those systems are integrated with the public health system. Because again, we talk about the health system, mm. but it's a remarkable in the 21st century that sometimes lab data is not available immediately to clinicians and clinical data is not immediately available to epidemiologists and there's a there are a lot of data barriers in the system some of that is just purely because the systems haven't been designed some of that is because of justified and rightful concerns about data protection hmm. and privacy uh, and we're constantly balancing the need to have data but also understanding that that data in a sense belongs to somebody uh, and usually a citizen who's had a test and doesn't necessarily want that test to be uh, in the public domain per se. So all of those challenges aside, um, I think uh, we are paying a price for a poorly planned, poorly funded, poorly implemented, comprehensive data architecture, a data ecosystem for public health. And as the system is pressured, it struggles more. Uh, and those of us, uh, Andrea and others, uh, are putting the fingers in the dike in a sense of, of trying to make those systems work. Although it's not all bad, and we maybe speak later, some, there's some excellent initiatives, for example, like, EI, uh, like EIOS, Epidemic Intelligence from Open Sources, where the, the European Commission, and thanks to the EC, have worked with us and many other partners to integrate an awful lot of the epidemic intelligence engines that exist around the world. So we now have a fully integrated platform for detecting epidemics through open sources. 
that didn't exist uh, for years and years. Uh, and mm -hmm. that is an example of institutions and agencies putting aside rivalries, putting aside commercial concerns, and integrating into an ecosystem and a platform where there's planned and programmed exchange of data uh, in, a, in a standardized way that allows everybody to see what's going on at the same time. Now, it takes time and investment to build systems like that. You cannot build them MacGyver style with duct tape in the middle of a pandemic. And that's, so I, I used to work on this myself years ago for the European Commission and um, someone, we used to describe the information systems as being like plumbing. You know, nobody notices until it goes wrong um, you know, and something smells. Uh, but uh, So we've seen an awful lot of attempts to help you know, people, so there's been these sources and I, a lot of these data systems have been working on months and weeks to be able to generate data. And yet now we've moved to a situation where we've wanted to see data hourly almost or daily. And when the main systems haven't worked, lots of other people have been trying to, to sort of to step in and that's created its own challenges. How have you been trying to sort of herd those cats at a, at a global level through the World Health Organization? Yes, uh, herding cats is a, is a, is a good term. Um, yeah, no, the, the, there is, there is a, there's, a, there's a lot in, in, in what you say. And pulling that data together from 194 different countries, all who have different systems, and trying to understand what that may, means when the surveillance systems are detecting different things in the countries, the testing regimes are different, the definition of a case may be different, and you're trying to pull that together at global at global level and hand out verified information. And there's a difference here between uh, data that's verified or data that's unverified. Mm -hmm. Another uh, element of that, because of that fast cycle, we're in that 24 hour news cycle. Unfortunately, we've entered the world of the hourly data cycle. Mm -hmm. Data is supposed to drive policy decisions. It's supposed to drive decision making and support decision making. And in fact, I think it's turned the other way around. Decision making has become disrupted by data because if imagine being a frontline worker, imagine being someone at the front line trying to manage clinical cases or a frontline doctor trying to do contact tracing. Mm -hmm. If you change the game every single day, if you change the case definition every day, if you change the clinical definition every day, the problem is that's fine for the people on top. The people in the system can't operate with that level of daily change to what they do in the front line. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really careful that just because we have data doesn't mean everything has to change. We really do have to build evidence, build data to make good policy and then change. In other words, the difference between strategy and tactics. The strategy is what we develop at a global or at an EU or at a national level. The tactics are what are developed locally. And therefore what local decision makers need is tactical information. What do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? If we keep changing the game, if we keep saying, oh, there's new data that says that was wrong yesterday and this is what you should do today, it sounds great. But I actually think in a complex emergency response, it sometimes isn't helpful. So we have to decide how we're going to use data and when we're going to use data. It's not just having the data. And you described that arc at the beginning very, uh, very clearly of the sort of the problems of generating data, of bringing it to data, together, of analyzing it, and ultimately feeding it into policy so that it's useful for something. And, and that raises a very interesting issue because our challenge normally with data and policy is we don't have enough data. And you're almost saying in some instances here, we, we've had too much or not the right, and, and we've, the tail's been wagging the dog a little bit. Um, Andrea, I, I, I would like to turn to you now. Um, the ECDC has been front and center in, in these efforts within the European Union. And of course you play a specific role because um, as well as the, facing the challenges of this international level um, within the European Union, the European Union is a jurisdiction itself. And so you're also, you're feeding into different levels of policy making as well here. What kind of challenges have you been facing in, in dealing with these surveillance systems um, from the member states of the European Union and what's being produced out of them yeah um i mean i probably if i list all the challenges uh, i think the time will not be uh, enough i just want to continue what mike has said um the i mean surveillance is the backbone of uh, prevention and controlling communicable diseases i mean we know that and we see that now uh, uh, again and he has highlighted some of the of the challenges um uh, I, I just want to say it's really uh, true that um, uh, you get out um, 
the data that you get uh, depend on the, de the system that you design. So, uh, but uh, before you uh, design the system, you have to be clear what you want to do with the data, because only then you can uh, uh, decide what you want to get into the system and design the system accordingly. So that's the theory. Um, and that is, of course, something that uh, we are trying with all the established diseases. And that is the first challenge in a new disease, because you actually um, it, it's very difficult what the, to, to assess what the disease will look like, what impact will it have, who will be impacted. And then you have to design accordingly what you have to, to collect. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the what uh, um, uh, the two challenges that we see right now is the standardization, yeah. uh, the, or the lack of, uh, and in particular the lack of sta uh, standards in uh, the data that go into the system. Yeah. So I think the system is standardized. I mean, there's a protocol, there is variable defined, and 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 blind blue. But I think the 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 data that go into the system that is depending on the testing regimes and uh, um, uh, the the frequency how how uh, the data can be can be supplied. So that is um, uh, uh, an issue in particular in the light of how the data are used because they are used for far-reaching uh, uh, policy decisions, like for border closures, uh, 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 travel uh, advice, uh, and um, when they, uh, seeing that they are not uh, um, actually comparable um, is, is uh, a challenge. So that's one part. The other part is the timeliness, because um, um, uh, even if I don't uh, think we, we need this on, a, on an hourly basis, um, you need this real time uh, so that you see what is the situation now. What we get is a situation that is two, three weeks prior to what we, uh, what we actually face uh, in the situation. And there is, I think, where uh, I hope in the, in the uh, uh, course of this discussion, we can see and, and uh, look into how we can facilitate both of these challenges with, uh, with new solutions. Well, I want to come to that because indeed, um, again, one of the comparisons that was made to me uh, uh, by a former commissioner actually was uh, when confronted with data about a particular issue who commented that this data was at least a year and in many instances more out of date. And that was referring to non-communicable disease rather than communicable disease, but it was still trying to land a plane whilst looking out of the back of it, you know. Um, so uh, we, we need to, uh, we need to come to these innovative solutions, but indeed the commissioner talked about harmonizing surveillance systems. But my impression, I, I, what, what, I should, I'm sat here in the UK, I'm going to refer to a UK example. When I look at the UK, just the sheer mechanics of being able to have a surveillance system at all still seems to be really challenging. So what's what's your advice now what are you looking for countries to do as we as we enter into this you know new difficult period of the winter what what should how do we get to these more harmonized surveillance systems i think we have to agree um uh, uh what is it that we want to get out of the system as i said before mm -hmm. um uh, and um, now when we look uh, forward to the winter we have to um uh, be able to monitor the various resp respiratory uh, uh, infections that will uh, usually occur in the winter in addition to COVID. So, and uh, for us, it's mainly influenza and 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 uh, COVID, but you could also think of respiratory virus, uh, syncytial virus and, and so forth. But influenza and, and um, uh, COVID need to be tracked during the winter. We have to be clear what the, uh, what is what and uh, uh, what are we dealing with. So mm -hmm. the, the, the thing is that we have uh, now discussed the protocol with the countries, how to actually get data into the system. I mean, in, in primary care, in the hospitals, setting up a, a system that is um, um, uh, capable of monitoring both. Now, this relies very heavily on laboratory diagnosis and there the challenges come already, um, the material was not enough and so forth. So, so, so um, 
uh, there are different elements and aspects to to the standards uh, or the lack of standards and the, the the implementation of such protocols. But it's important that we try as good as we as we are, we are able uh, to uh, set it up in the similar way in all the countries. If we want, in the end, then compare the data and base uh, political decisions on this. Oh, yes, I, I, I absolutely see what you're saying. Yeah, we need if we if we want to have the right systems, we need to know about what they're aiming to achieve. Um, but that comes back to Mike to your point about strategy and tactics. Um, how how clear do you think all the member states for for both of you maybe how clear do you? But maybe if I come to you first, Dr. Ryan. Do we have a clear understanding, do you think? Is there a clear strategy in place? And what would you see as being the key elements of what we need to be saying to member states, this is where you have to focus the efforts now? Um, I, I think uh, ECDC and the, the, the member states and, and member states globally have, have all had to adapt to a number of things. One is the situation in their own country. Two the cultural acceptance of things like data collection and things like restrictions of movement and, and other things. So you, you can compare country to country, but if we take your point in the specific realm of data management and data collection, uh, probably not. We don't have enough integration in terms of, first of all, what is to be collected, what we should be collecting. There are, there are lots of good guidance, including our own and ECDCs about, about what could be collected and you'll notice very often when we issue guidance in this space we talk about considerations because you're you're telling countries yes you could measure these five things and this is what it will tell you then you can measure another four things this is what it will tell you what we haven't agreed um uh, globally i think is is a, a standing data architecture for the sharing of a minimum data set on any given disease that, that emerges from nature uh, and you'd imagine if we had a disease emerging from nature in two or three years' time, you'd want case data, death data. You'd like to know hospitalizations. You'd like to know the number of people tested. Uh, you'd like to know the proportion of people tested who were positive. Uh, you know, so it's not that's not rocket science. You know, it's not the, the the newness of the virus in a sense may have unique data collection characteristics. You'd want a minimum data set on primary symptoms. Uh, you'd want a minimum data set on the number of people in intensive care. You know, so I do think we could do better in creating a, a global minimum data set that w everybody would collect across a disease and then whatever countries want to collect extra. And I think that's that's a gap currently. Um, and to do that, we need we need a better ecosystem for how we manage data. For example, we need to, to look at epidemic prediction. We need to look at assessing preparedness. There's lots of other measurement needs to be done. It's not just measuring the bug. We need to be able to predict what's going to happen. We need to be able to see how ready systems are. And you'll notice in the assessments that have been done, we've had a very static view of assessing things. We tend to count things. We count buildings and we count people, but we don't, we haven't measured the dynamic capacity of the system. Yeah, exactly. We measure we measure how long the piece of string is, but we don't measure how strong it is or how elastic it is. Mm -hmm. We just measure one thing. And we've been very much measuring static things. The other thing is we, we're not, uh, we need data as well. If you think about rolling out vaccine now, just think about the challenge. It's not just a vaccine challenge. Who's going to get it? Where's the vaccine going to be? Where is it going to be stored? All of the logistic arrangements, that's going to require a massive effort in data. Mm. Because uh, we need to know who's getting the vaccine and who should get it next, who's prioritized, who's not. That's going to be a mess unless we get better at managing data. So I think we need, we, we're working on a, on, a, on a system at the moment, and we have been for, for a couple of years now, an, an ecosystem with the concept of EpiBrain. And the idea being that we build a common ecosystem for data around the world. And within that, we've already done use cases for, for EpiCast, which is a forecasting system, EpiSim simulation system, EpiVax a way of using data to manage vaccine distribution, an EpiWin, which we've used to manage the infodemic. And I think there's a lot of work that we can't do that now, it's not possible. But I do think your point is well made. We, we do not, and we do not have, and we could do better at managing national, regional, and global data sets, standardizing the data we share, uh, so we know what a case means in country X or Y. Uh, and I think that would definitely improve the way we can respond to these epidemics and pandemics. 
Thank you, Mike. That's that's the commissioner, for example, talked about innovative digital systems, and I think that you know that 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 sounds like an innovative digital system to me. And I, I, I fingers crossed for for seeing that being realised. Andrea, you were also talking about you know, perhaps we can we can be more innovative in the ways in which we are addressing this data this data challenge. Um, and I know here, for example, I've, you know, it, it's as just as Dr. Ryan was saying, there's the data about the disease, but there's the data about how many staff you have who do or do who are or are not able to work, and maybe what the current state of those staff is who've been working flat out for six months, and how they feel in the run up to the winter. So, I, and different sources of collecting data which aren't just the formal counting data, uh, formal counting structures. What kind of ideas do you see or would you want to highlight in terms of areas to consider for these kinds of innovative solutions? Well, I think uh, some of these um, um, uh, solutions um, could help uh, to reduce the uh, uh, number of steps in the current system where human input is necessary. Because this is the, 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 um, the human that put this um, data in or transport the data somewhere it are, are the ones that do the case finding, the uh, contact tracing, and then in the end of the day, they have to do uh, the data uh, collection as well. Uh, so that I think can be looked at, what are the processes here that can be uh, uh, digitalized? But I think we can also go further uh, in terms of <clears throat> some, some uh, support to, through digital solu solutions in terms of helping us maintaining the standards. Like uh, uh, Mike Ryan mentioned uh, the case definitions. Right now, the, the, apply, uh, the application of a case definition is depending that a nurse or a doctor uh, goes through the criteria and then uh, uh, says this is a case, this is not a case. That can be done by an algorithm. I mean, case definitions are algorithms that can be, can be programmed and then sort of uh, uh, apply it to a, to a bigger data set in a standardized way. I mean, but many of these solutions will, of course, uh, depend on the um, uh, progress made uh, by uh, using electronic health records, uh, mm -hmm. because that would be then a source where this data can be pulled from instead of transported by someone clicking a button. Um, uh, but I think, uh, you know, it's not only the technical solutions here, it's really also the the um, uh, data protection uh, issues. But I think all this can be overcome um, uh, in, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in ways. So this is the, the, the area that uh, uh, would apply to the current system. Now, we have seen uh, in this pandemic uh, uh, an unprecedented, uh, um, uh, well, field trial of these apps. Um, and I just uh, thinking about putting something like this in place would have taken much longer if we had done this in peacetime. Um, uh, so, so even though, um, uh, according to the first uh, feedback that we get, that the apps uh, not necessarily meet all the expectations, I think it gives us experience where we can learn from and design the next generation of these apps. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is the way where we may also go, because this is the data collection, not depending on a laboratory or a doctor, but maybe on, on the, the direct source, uh, uh, meaning the potential patient. So I think there are there are ways that uh, we, we, we just have to, 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 to look at and see what can we now here standardize and digitalize. Standardize and digitalize. Well, um, so the two key words, which I think we will pick up on when we come into the second part of the panel, um, we're, we're, oh, second part of the session, we're coming to the end of this panel now. Um, and I know that you are, you're, you're both extremely busy people. So I know that you, you I, I, I hope you'll be able to stay with us for at least a little bit of the next session, but I understand that you might not be able to. Um, I, I, I want I to end on a note of optimism and vision for the future. So I, I have a, um, I have an, this wonderful dream that it, you know, it, we, in two or three years time, we will be in a situation where we have the pandemic under control Let's hope that my colleagues up the hill who are doing their vaccine and all the other colleagues doing vaccines will uh, will you know give us a route out of this. Probably not an absolutely perfect one, but that combined with really effective data and surveillance that is in a timely way informing policy allows us to get back to a more normal version of life. 
and also that we learn from this to create data systems which are ready for the next time and which give us a sense of greater capacity for all the other conditions where you both have been struggling to have member states collect data for years. You haven't just landed with this frustration, you've had frustrations you've been dealing with for decades. If we're going to end up at a, a world where we have better data giving rise to that better outcome, what should what would be what was what should we be doing now? What would happen now that would be the things that would get us on that pathway to get us to a good outcome in, um, with this disease and laying the groundwork for a better information architecture in the future? Andrea, perhaps this time I could come to you first and then I will, I will, I will um, give uh, Mike the, the last word. Um, okay, so I mean we have always learned from a from, uh, um, uh, crisis, but I think here since the crisis is so massive, uh, we have to really do an, in, um, a systematic learning. So we have designed actually uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of a protocol for inaction reviews because we can't wait on, on, until this all is over, um, where we can systematically collect what has been seen uh, as challenged in certain uh, in certain uh, places in certain countries countries have made different uh, uh, experience some have made the same experience and that can be pulled together uh, and and do a collective learning from this i fully agree we should not only look at uh, how we can manage this pandemic but really also manage in general much better uh, the prevention and control of infectious diseases perfect thank you dr ryan um, no, I think it's great, and thanks for, for pushing us to end on that positive note. Uh, we've seen uh, again and again how data defeats disease. We've seen that with polio, with the introduction of AFP surveillance. We saw that with the surveillance for smallpox. It wasn't just the smallpox vaccine that eradicated smallpox. It was the most massive surveillance operation that the world had ever seen in, this, in the midst of the Cold War with Russian and American scientists and people from all, working together with pen and paper. They didn't have apps, they didn't have anything else. They had pen and paper, uh, uh, but they came together. So the issue, the success there wasn't the technology. The success was the collaboration around data, how we do it. The great advantage we have now is that we've never had a better opportunity to build the platforms that drive that collaboration. But it's collaboration and sharing of data is the key. Technology facilitates the speed and quality of that process. And we need to leverage and tap into that. We believe projects like EpiBrain provide a framework to bring together a global collaboration around that, not a top-down approach. Use the data you have. One of the first things I did here with Dr. Tedros when we came in uh, a couple of years ago was everyone was saying, we need a new system to manage emergencies in WHO. And the first thing we invested in, instead of a new system, was an API driven system and most of our emergencies data and I'm looking at another screen at our emergencies dashboard. What it does is it uses APIs to, to reach out within our own organization and pull together all the data we have on epidemics and our responses. So we can see a full screen of all of that data integrated. We need to use what we have better. We need to build better platforms, but not platforms for the sake of it. Platforms for doctors, nurses, epidemiologists and others to collaborate and share vital information so we make better decisions on behalf of the citizens that we serve. In the end, we serve people, not ourselves and not the systems. We serve people and we need to turn, make data work for people. I believe we have never, ever, ever in the history of this planet had a better opportunity. Actually, the only thing standing in our way is ourselves, to be quite frank. That's a wonderful note to end this session on. I've taken some really strong messages out of this, messages about the importance of standardization, about the importance of timeliness, about having data which has a clear policy goal. What do we want out of this? What is the, the outcome we want it to support? And collaboration. In the end, it all comes down to how people are going to work together. So my thanks uh, in her absence to Commissioner Kiriakides and in their presence to Dr. Mike Ryan um, and Dr. Andrea Ammon, with a special thanks to Dr. Ammon for the ECDC's support for this session. Um, I, I, I know, Mike, you have you have to go, and I, and I don't know, Andrea, whether or not you're going to be able to stay. If you are able to stay, then we'll bring you back in for this um, towards the end of the session. But thank you very much this time. Uh,
Now, what we're going to do now uh, within uh, this overall panel is we're going to do two things. And the second thing is a break. But the first thing um, is we're going to put up another Wisembly question. Um, so this time, having listened to what uh, our um, esteemed panelists have said in the first part, is we're going to ask you to put up a one word answer to what, what do you think has been the main challenge in your own country in managing the COVID-19 pandemic? Has it been a lack of data? Has it been a lack of preparedness? Has it been a lack of leadership? Maybe a lack of collaboration between different actors. Remember one word only, if you put lack of, then it will just spread everywhere. So just, if you mean um, lack of data, just put data as the main problem. And while we're gonna leave this up for a, a, another three or four minutes, just to give everyone a chance to refresh yourselves very quickly, make a cup of tea perhaps, um, and then we'll come back for our second panel in uh, just a few minutes. Once again, my thanks to all of you for the first panel. Okay, so there's some very interesting things coming up there. Uh, lack of citizen awareness. Oh, I see what you did there. Um, misinformation, lack of coordination, lack of transparency, uh, lack of data. That's that. That's in there. But it's very interesting, isn't it? The word right in the centre. The really strong one is lack of preparedness. Um, which I think is so interesting because of, we've had so many exercises around preparedness for these kinds of issues. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will agree that, uh, that this, um, this first discussion was really interesting. We've talked about what these different challenges are and what we need to be doing at the moment. Talked about these themes of standardization, of timeliness, of collaboration and of working for a purpose. We talked about innovation um, uh, digital solutions, for example, and I uh, will be talking about that in this session. And we're now we're going to look at what some of the specific country experiences are. And I'm joined again by um, three esteemed panelists, Dr. Isabel de la Fuente um, from the Centre Hospitalier of Luxembourg, um, Professor Sotirios Tsiotras, who is Professor of Internal Medicine and Infectious Diseases in Greece, and Professor Tuva Fall, um, who is Professor of Molecular Biology at Uppsala University in Sweden, and I'm very glad to welcome them all. Um, ladies and gentlemen, participants, you can also submit questions to our panel. You have the Q&A function um, up uh, also that you will have seen up on the right-hand side of the screen. So uh, um, if you would like to submit questions, and in fact, I can already see a very interesting some very interesting questions which I'm going to put across there. Um, but uh, in the first instance, what I'd like to do is I'd like to draw on some of these questions that we had from uh, the first panel. So we talked about standardization, we talked about um, how to put in place these systems at a national level. And Dr. De La Fuente, um, in Luxembourg, I, we think of Luxembourg, I, 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 hate, to, I hate to mention this, but it's the richest member state of the union. You have the highest per capita income. And so we, we I, I think someone who doesn't know the country might think that everything is perfect in Luxembourg, but at the, at the same time, it's also a small country. Um, it's bordered by very much larger countries. There's a lot of people coming back and forth across the borders every day. Um, Dr. De La Fuente, would you like to talk to us about some of the challenges that you faced um, within Luxembourg in relation to data uh, in this pandemic. Isabel, you're, you're, still, you're still muted somehow. Still not working. I tell you what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you a chance to, um, to sort that out. Um, and uh, I've already, yeah, we've already had a fire alarm. A little problem with a, with a microphone is nothing. Um, and what I will do is I will, I will turn instead to Greece and um, Professor Tsiotras, um, because I, I know that, uh, that there were some very specific challenges in the Greek context um, and that you have uh, some, I think you, uh, you have quite some learnings during, your period, uh, during this period in Greece and um, perhaps you would like to, uh, to tell us about that. And I think you also have some slides to show us about that. Yes, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I would like to share a little bit of our uh, experience uh, visualizing it. I know we're talking about strengthening health systems and uh, overall research and public health. 
uh, actions in the European Union. And we're talking today about critical information needs. And uh, we're discussing how organizations can best support member states in generating such information. So, uh, heterogeneity in incidents, both uh, the esteemed speakers uh, talked about it uh, during the first half of this session. And uh, they emphasized uh, on uh, comparing comparedness of data. Uh, of course, local aspects differ, something we all realize. At uh, the left uh, side uh, of uh, the slide, uh, you can see special problems in Greece uh, relating to vulnerable population that consists 65% of recent clusters in our country. And of course, geographically isolated areas like the islands. And uh, uh, something that's evident in the right hand, uh, the right side of the slide, you, you see the number of cases per 100,000 population in the ECDC map from yesterday. And you can see the great heterogeneity in numbers across member states. And in the right uh, 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 side of this uh, picture, there is a, a map again from the ECDC uh, where uh, clusters, local clusters are depicted within countries versus community transmission, which is another level of discussion, which is the overall picture. And when one looks at countries per se, mostly sees local transmission, uh, um, uh, local clusters, whereas some of those local clusters signify community transmission, and we haven't cleared this issue. Uh, yet, and it, it basically is uh, the country's input that uh, identifies local cluster versus a community transmission rather than a harmonized index. Uh, the other thing is, uh, this is a map uh, from Greece, and uh, this is areas, the number of cases per, uh, per uh, specific uh, local areas, where you can see the, the variance in, in affected areas uh, uh, over the, uh, the months of this pandemic. And uh, the age distribution, of course, differs, and and comorbidity is different, and we don't have enough data on other factors very important uh, with regards to the epidemic. Whether some locale, some local uh, spots, uh, differ with regards to comorbidities and the population mix that's affected by the pandemic. Of course, there are long-term care facilities, homeless people, the contact tracing data. Uh, we have tried to digitalize this uh, very recently. We, and I, I shared very interest, uh, a very interesting comment by Mike Ryan saying that use the data you have. And initially in the pandemic, what we used uh, very, very uh, uh, commonly was a predictive model with regards to uh, our health system capacity, which is, you know, all health systems are not that great in dealing with the pandemic. We know that from the Latin America situation. And uh, of course, new ICU beds versus expansion to other uh, ICU beds from other uh, units like cardiothoracic surgery or, mm -hmm. or neurosurgery was an issue initially in Greece as well as in other countries. And of course, uh, guided our decision uh, towards uh, a, an early lockdown rather than waiting. Uh, and of course, stockpiling on PPEs and the solidarity was a big, big issue for, for, for a strong health system initially. And we, 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 we sensed, you know, this uh, non-solidarity amongst nations that someone one of your um, uh, attendees highlighted in, 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 in uh, the previous uh, uh, question that you raised. Of course, uh, we, we don't have a lot of infection prevention and control data, and we do not know what works best as regards to this data. We only assess this uh, capacity and activities based on the healthcare worker uh, uh, ratio of affected uh, uh, of cases. Uh, of course, we do not know what works best. For example, the seven versus ten day rule for healthcare workers, especially on a on a weak health system. And uh, if you look across the the organizations, they don't have standard they don't have standard guidance. Uh, well, guidance exists but differs. And of course, testing non versus non testing based strategies for discontinuing isolation, especially as influenza comes up, uh, as uh, Andrea mentioned, this is going to be a big issue. And of course, the modeling helped us in anticipating pressure. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a clock we have devised to, to, to see pressure in our health system in different areas of the country. Uh, the other thing is, uh, a few days ago, there was a big comment in the press about numbers that people interpret erroneously. Uh, like, for example, the number of uh, uh, deaths uh, per uh, uh, identified cases. 
and uh, uh, people said that this is a uh, there's a huge uh, uh, mistake there, and that uh, some countries are doing much worse. And uh, of course, they didn't understand that this came from a big scientist. This, they, they didn't understand that uh, uh, the percent of deaths per new cases per million is an, ind an index that's not used by any national or, inter or international organization, and it could be affected by several parameters that cannot be fully addressed, and we don't have enough data for these parameters as a European Union, as a world uh, in general. And uh, we, we, we used our, uh, we were lucky enough to have a, a, a participation in a network called uh, an excessive mortality network uh, coordinated by the CDC. And you can see on the left side of the picture, week 14 of 2020, when we didn't have enough testing in our country and uh, we only monitored uh, severe cases and deaths, we were happy to have this uh, as a, a very, very good index uh, assisting us in, in, in our policy decision uh, and uh, knowing that things go well when we didn't have the extremely high excess mortality seen in other European countries. And this is something that not all countries share and within some countries, not all prefectures share. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing is uh, the, the local aspects uh, between countries as far as number of cases per 100,000, this from the ECDC, there's the cumulative number of deaths per uh, 100,000, which may uh, depict a, a difference in, in, in health system capacity and health system preparedness, as highlighted by some of our listeners. Of course, the data, to, the use of data to guide measures is not an easy task. And we've seen over the last month or so several epidemiological criteria uh, that differ across organizations from WHO to ECDC to UK data to Ireland to Canadian to CDC parameters. And the question there, the big question in my mind is whether it is every country different, whether cultural aspects are very important. Um, uh, data protection issues are very, very important as well, especially when using apps uh, and, uh, and tracing uh, software. And people, people need to know what's coming. Risk communication is extremely tough. I've been the spokesperson of the Ministry of Health and the government for the last six months, and it was a, a very, very unique experience, a very, very difficult thing uh, to, 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 be, to be clear. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, science needs uh, uh, versus politics is a big issue, whether science can assist politicians in their decisions. Um, this is a draft uh, of our measures uh, that were based on, on, on international guidance using a number of cases, percent of positive PCR uh, and uh, effective reproduction number. And, um, and uh, combining this with our health system capacity with regards to ICU uh, bed capacity and uh, single bed capacity for, uh, for COVID. Um, as far as uh, critical information needs, uh, our experience was that we based our first initial phase on hard uh, data uh, like hospitalizations and ICU bed utilization. We use predictive modeling to enhance our infrastructure. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, there's several other challenges like uh, the, the, the nursing homes, uh, the vulnerable groups, the geographically remote areas and contact tracing. We uh, adapted the manual system instead of a digital system uh, due to data protection uh, issues and, uh, and low acceptance rates in the country. Of course, the second wave or the rise in incidents we're currently seeing across uh, Europe and in our country. We need to validate our predictive models based, uh, based on our first uh, experience and, uh, of course, uh, we need to, to harmonize our indexes, uh, digitize our, uh, our platforms, uh, standardize and digitize them uh, so they can be ideally used uh, uh, via cross-border collaboration. Uh, and we need, with using harmonized indices, to guide measures in a harmonized fashion, depicting credible information. The risk communication remains crucial. Uh, it was very hard to maintain trust uh, and uh, giving the overall picture with appropriate analysis versus the last minute uh, uh, journalist uh, targeted details uh, that were not adequately uh, scrutinized. And believe me, that was a, a really a hard thing. We've managed to collaborate with the government in a very, very good uh, uh, way. And uh, we persuade them to build a digital platform where our uh, weekly, we, pre we present the, uh, the, the, the course of the pandemic in the country and along with financial labor data, culture data, 
and uh, and prevention data. I think this was uh, crucial, and we hope this will continue. Thank you very much. Gosh, uh, Professor, you've, you've you've covered quite a lot of ground there, and there are so many things that I want to ask you about, but I don't think we um, I don't think we have time. Um, I'm particularly interested that you raised the Euromomo uh, project because uh, partly because it was my former colleagues in the commission, I think, who helped to fund that originally. So I'm delighted to see it being referred to. But one of the interesting things is the point of that project, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, was precisely to generate this information about excess mortality, which is a rather nice way of sort of sidestepping um, all the questions about testing and focusing on one of the most reliable and comparable data sets that we have between countries, which is mortality, and being able to provide a real understanding of overall excess mortality. And yet, it's only partial across the European Union. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, why is that? Why is, what are the barriers, in your view, to, to actually being able to have this kind of collaboration? Um, uh, between countries, do you think? I think it was pretty easy to do it in Greece. Uh, we, we built on this uh, over the, 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 the last few years. And uh, uh, you basically collect death certificates, you know, from the entire country and, uh, and do an analysis. And, and I, my friends, uh, scientists that uh, coordinate this, uh, this uh, 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 project, uh, uh, told me that it's a very easy to implement project. So it's very hard for me to understand why it's not widely implemented across Europe. And maybe the CDC has a role in, in, in coordinating such an effort. So we have uh, a hard uh, index that, that can give us uh, reliable data across countries. And, uh, and I think it's very, very important. And it, it was a huge issue during the first phase of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it will probably come back. But it, it comes back to Dr. Ryan's point, doesn't it? It's, I, you know, I, I love the way that he presented the, the challenges around around polio, for example. You know, this wasn't this was a the key thing here was collaboration in his word, and I and I think that that, that project is another illustration of that. Um, but I also like many of the in, innovative solutions that you've described, and I, I think on this I'd like now to um, uh, to turn to Professor uh, Fall, um from Sweden because I, I don't. Yeah. Sweden has been talked about quite a lot um, in relation to the character, distinctive character of the response. Um, but I think we should um, also pay attention to some of the challenges of, of data and monitoring that you've faced within um, Sweden. And perhaps you would like to, to tell us about some of that. Mm, thank you. So uh, I'm a university professor and I got very involved in COVID research. Uh, over this pandemia. And one big challenge that we faced during the spring was the lack of testing available to the community. So we looked around for other alternatives. What can we do that is dynamic, scalable, real time? And we found out about this COVID symptom study app that's been developed by scientists at King, King's College London and a company called Zoe Limited, Global Limited. So we were able to introduce this app in Sweden in late April, and we now have 200,000 uh, participants in our research study that are uh, reminded daily to log their symptoms, their data about whether they got tested today or not, if it was a PCR test, if it was an antibody test. We also have a lot of background information on our participants, and they also give their postal codes. So we don't track them with GPS or anything like that. But what's so interesting about this, that it's really real time. We get the data the day after, and it also wipes out all the problems we see with the varying testing strategy that's been throughout this period. And I also wanted to show a slide where I plotted some of the problems we see using testing as the main tool for surveillance. Yes, thank you. Yeah. OK, so on this slide is my area in uh, around Uppsala, where I work and live. And here, the color represent the amount of testing per capita. So it's not about positive tests, it's just who gets tested and where do they live. And a white color on the map indicates that there is very little testing. So on to the left, you can see the entire region. 
And of course, little testing could be due to lack of symptoms and reasons to get tested, but we also see a strong correlation to the left where, where you get tested. So the further you live from a testing station, the less you're prone to go and get tested. It can also be difficult to travel if you have symptoms, for example. You shouldn't travel in a bus or so, so this is not just lack of will to get tested. But also to the right, we see some other challenges. And this is zooming in on my city. And you can see some white spots by the arrows. And unfortunately, these are the low socioeconomic areas. So there we have problems with lack of information, I think, that we don't get it through, that if you have symptoms, you should go and get tested. And this app-based uh, symptoms surveillance, I would say, solves, completely solves the problem to the left with the geographic. Problem. So we have really participants throughout the country, but we do see that we have similar problems as to the right. How do we get people in all areas uh, with the maybe lower education, language difficulties and so on to participate? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, you're winning the gold star for, uh, for technology management so far, you, you, you and Sotirius. Um, no, uh, Sweden, we have Spotify and everything. We're good yeah, in really, really, it's a national, national strength. Um, the, uh, it's so interesting because this question of the digital divide um, is very important and I, um, so one of the things that I do research on is uh, patient engagement in research and, and, and um, practice and when we switched to everything being remote we thought well gosh this is going to have a very negative impact and of course it does have a negative impact in some ways but it also enabled some people to take part who otherwise would not have felt able to take part um uh so it's it's interesting that you know you have a solution here that addresses some inequalities but not other inequalities mm. but this isn't a problem of the digital technology this is a much wider system problem if i understand mm. correct yeah so i think in sweden we have extremely high uh, kind of ownership of smartphones and also internet connection that is not the problem here i think the problem is getting the information out and the app is currently just in Swedish and uh, we have more that kind of problems with uh, maybe education levels and so on. But I think that, uh, I mean, there's so interesting things with this app, like um, we heard about uh, dynamic uh, solutions and the moving target by Dr. Ryan. and. Mm. Like now we have these symptoms, so you click if you have a headache, fever, loss of smell and so on, but we also have this free text. And there people can enter any symptoms like rashes or tachycardia. So now we can pick out new symptoms that seems to discriminate between those that test positive in PCR test and those, those that do not. And we can do that you know, on a weekly basis, it's so nice. And we can just implement it and push it out to all the, actually more than 4 million users worldwide. And we can also compare countries because this app uh, is available in the UK, in the US and Sweden. So it's an um, amazing resource, I would say, because it's so comparable. People are you know, similar, even though we have to be very careful with translations and so on. So they mean the same thing. So this is going to be a very interesting um, example of these uh, innovative digital solutions that Commissioner Kiriakidis referred to. Um, so uh, what, there's been a very interesting question uh, which links to a theme that I wanted to pick up on. I'm going to come, uh, Professor Teodros, to you in a few moments uh, about this bridge that Mike Ryan also talked about from the data and the evidence to policy. So this whole role of scientific advice and how we translate that. But before I do that, Isabel, I wanted to, I wanted to have another go at hearing about uh, Luxembourg. So. Um, uh, if you uh, if you're able to connect, then um, uh, I'm going to turn off my microphone and we'll see. Uh, okay. So do you want to? Do you hear us now? Can you hear me now? We hear you very quietly, but we hear you. Okay. Very good. Is it better now? <laughs> okay. Good. So you said you were saying about Luxembourg being a very really large country, which is of course exact, but it was very very challenging in Luxembourg. So in Luxembourg, we have an increasing population. So just you know, in the last 10 years, we increased one fourth of the population. And it's a very young population. Half of the country is not Luxembourgish, which is already reflecting lots of travelers, people going out and on in the country. And we have 
Every day, one third increase of the population by border, by cross border workers. Isabel, are you able to? I think you're using your phone. If you're able to yes. bring it closer to you, I think. Well, is it better like that? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> we go to. <laughs> okay. So, yes, to go back, I would say that Luxembourg is very wealthy, but it has big challenges uh, dealing with the crisis. So, the first thing is that we have an increasing population, very, very fast increasing population. In the last 10 years, the country increased one fourth of the population. And we have every day one third of increase of the population by cross border workers. So we have 200,000 people coming from Belgium, France, Germany to work to Luxembourg every day. And the population is very young, and almost half of the population is not Luxembourgish. So people that are traveling, coming back from their home country. So I think this was quite unique for Luxembourg. The second thing is that it's a young country and our, our institutions are quite young. So for example, our Luxembourgish Institute of Health, which is mainly a research institute, and it's not the same as other public health institutes in Europe, it's young, it's five years old. And so it was, this was a very first unique opportunity to to coordinate all the players together, the ministry, the university, which is young as well, our Luxembourgish Institute of Health, academic institute, and we really had to play together very fast and react very quickly. So this was a very big challenge. And the third challenge I would say was the data. So we didn't have any problem of getting data, but we had lots of data because we, so we did lots of tests. We were among the countries doing more tests in the population. So of course we were doing syndromic surveillance, but we had as well very large scale testing. So with large scale testing, some days we had up to 2.5 of the population being tested. <laughs> so there's been lots of data from citizens, but as well from cross-border workers. And then we had to make it useful with a new virus and with all these unknown answers. So, so yes, we did have resources, but it has been a very big challenge for Luxembourg. It was difficult for us as well because at some point we had very big numbers of infections compared to the population, but most of them were among asymptomatic patients and up to 10 15% of them came from the large scale testing. So we had bad numbers, but at the end we had very low people in the hospitals, very low mortality rate, <laughs> and, uh, and good, good uh, organization in the hospitals. And that was very difficult to communicate in Luxembourg and outside Luxembourg for uh, foreign politics and for uh, yes, borders. Travels, <laughs> and I think yes, this was maybe quite a unique position of Luxembourg between the other EU members. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, um, Isabel. thank you, and I'm so glad that we got the chance to to hear from you. And, and I'm so sorry with with all the technical uh, challenges. Um, so I, you, you've, it's such an interesting picture, isn't it? So you have this very changing population. You've described the increase in population over recent years, and then the daily, this massive change in people who come in and out of the country every day, which I think is nearly unique within the European uh, Union. Um, and although you had these institutions, that they were still quite young, and there's collaboration. You know, there weren't you, there wasn't an established structure of organisations working together. Um, which I think might have been slightly more the case in other countries than maybe was visible actually, when I think about some countries that I know well. And then not a challenge of having too little data, but having too much data and it not being clear what all of that data meant. And and yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a very interesting picture so that even, even the best resourced countries, so we sometimes think, oh, if we only had a bit more money, it would all be fixed. But actually even the best resourced countries still, still faced enormous challenges in this process. So thank you very much. Um, Professor Tiotras, I as I warned you, I, I, I want to come to you because I want to, so 
one of these issues, and I, there's a question that's been asked about, do member states need to join up their scientific advice structures to facilitate better sharing of data? Um, and there's two things there. There's one thing about sharing of data, but there's another thing about presenting coherent scientific advice, because you said that you, you've been the face in a certain sense for Greece, and we've had a couple of people in the UK who have been the face for the government here. I don't envy any of you. Um, sounds terrible. Um, but one of the difficulties, of course, has been when those messages haven't been consistent between countries. Do you, what do you think about that? Is there scope for something which is a more collaborative process of scientific? You know, what, what, what should we understand from this data at, at the European level? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I share the feeling that uh, scientific advisory boards across country need to interact more need to communicate, need to, to speak about criteria and how this criteria might affect political decisions. Political decisions are, are, are very, very, uh, the political world is different from uh, the scientific world. Uh, politicians are practical people, they want to deliberate on issues and uh, they, they have the ability to act uh, on, on issues. We recommend, uh, we uh, discuss with scientists uh, and we're not obligated to take action in our hands. And, and, and the political, uh, the policy makers want to give credibility to their decisions uh, based on scientific arguments. And this is a very, very difficult arena. Uh, and it, it creates tension as well. And we've seen it around the, the world. And uh, I don't want to give specific examples because uh, I, would, uh, I would have to name <laughs> countries and people. But, uh, but uh, uh, for anyone who looks at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, international journalism uh, will, will realize that this this game was not fair and, and sometimes it was unfair for the scientists and mostly it was unfair for the scientists I would like to say and I think that the, the collaboration between scientific boards across uh, the board uh, is is uh, is going to assist in this uh, in this interaction with policymakers this is uh, we, we see this for the first time in our lives we never thought we would experience such a thing. And it, it's difficult. It's working in a tight room. Hmm. No, and it's a space which I think um, for us as academics, we find very uncomfortable actually, because there is, there is men, and we've seen it actually. So there's been issues where scientists have been trying to help, but that has led us to perhaps go quicker than we normally would. We've had the whole discussions about so much stuff has been published, some of it not even peer reviewed, but even some of it has gone through very, very quickly. And then there have been some notable challenges and issues with some of that. So I wonder if, because I, in the first part, in the first panel, we were talking about timeliness, we were talking about harmonization, we were focusing on the data, but Mike Ryan in particular was also talking about being clear about what this data is being used for. And so that bridge between data and, 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 and policy is a, is a very tricky one. Um, Professor um, Fall, in Sweden, uh, I, I know that the world has been watching that bridge in Sweden. Is there what what's your what's been your impression of this kind of this relationship between scientific advice between data and advice and action? I would say, as a scientist, it's a huge challenge, and I think about it every day. Like, if I have interesting data that could be helpful, I need to communicate them, right? So uh, how, uh, how meticulous should I be? Should I wait a year until I'm really, really sure? And then it's too late, right? So mm. the balance between uh, presenting my results to the public, um, and it's also difficult as a scientist because uh, we're not used to our findings being politicized very quickly. So now like immunologists with a T cell story, that's like a political, question like do we believe in t-cell immunity or not you know so it's it's a very difficult situation as a scientist actually to to how you should communicate the results too early is not good too late is neither good so it's something i struggle with and i think we have to help each other so we can always do a quick peer review by sending my data for example to some critical friend who will go through it quickly and look at the major limitations so i think we really need to maybe use the peer review in a more informal way. And I think the, uh, the agencies can also do that. If they have a report, send it out, 
to academics who will quickly review and point at certain limitations and it can quickly be updated. Perfect. And I and I wonder actually if this is um, I, I I'm not sure if either Andrea or Mike are still there and are able to um, to to join us for a final session of the um, the Q and A process. Uh, oh, as if by as if by magic, Andrea appears. Um, because the, this is a really difficult balancing act. Where do you see? And I know I'm I'm asking a slightly awkward question here. I apologise. Um, where do you see the role of an entity like the ECDC, not just in the data collection, but in this kind of the governance around advice into policy and and how different the, the academic and scientific worlds can feed into policy in a in a meaningful and helpful way? Well, uh, Nick, this has been the, the debate uh, since in the last uh, nine uh, months. Um, Right now, from the legal basis, our role is to um, do the scientific part, uh, the provide the assessment uh, and the options for response. Uh, of course, we have seen, as in previous uh, crisis situation, that uh, some of the countries really uh, want us now to change the role that is given to us by the legal framework, saying, uh, tell us what to do. Um, and we have to be very careful here um, because uh, um, what, as you have seen from uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, Soterios uh, uh, pictures, the situation uh, is not even within the uh, between the countries is the same, but it's also within the country you have different situations. So it is very difficult from where we stand to actually give advice to each uh, uh, a local a locally different um, uh, uh, situation. Mm. So uh, for us, it's really uh, more to be um, what we what we would wish for is. We will be, have a bit more influence on on uh, saying, well, this is the testing strategy as we have published it now. Um, please follow, well, not say please follow this and countries can decide whether uh, or not, but that they have a certain obligation to follow that. That would solve a, 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 a number of issues or would have solved a number of issues that we have right now. But really to decide what some uh, country should do on a local level, that is not possible from, from where we are. No, of course. And then, I mean, so we had the interesting situation um, in this country. Uh, reading one of our national newspapers, uh, just so we've just had some quite shifts in the measures being taken within the UK just recently. And uh, as the chief medical officer and the chief science officer were, were giving their, this is our situation, a group of academics wrote a, you know, this is the evidence and it tells you that you should do this. And on the same day, another group of academics wrote and said, this is the evidence and it says that you should do that, which was more or less exactly the opposite. So for the rest of the world, of course, this is very difficult. And I imagine it's only even more difficult at the global level, Mike. I, I know that part of the role of the WHO has been to sort of to navigate this kind of this balance of different opinions and advice. Um, how do you do that? How do you manage that in this kind of a situation? No, it's the, I think it's the toughest job in the world. Uh, the, the, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, everyone has an opinion uh, and an opinions matter, you know, and, and we need that robust discourse. We need to have differences of opinion and we need the outliers. Sometimes the solutions come from the periphery, not from the center. So how do you maintain momentum with good evidence, but keeping your ears and your eyes and more importantly, your mind open to alternative uh, hypotheses and alternative. The, the difficulty I think becomes the discourse gets coarse and then you end up in these situations where scientists start fighting and start saying, you're not listening to us, uh, and we have, we are right and you're wrong, and then it turns into, and that's fine, that may be great scientific discourse, that doesn't sound very good to a concerned community, that doesn't reassure anybody uh, when the scientists start having a go at each other. It's one thing for the politicians to be at it, that that's their job, I suppose, but uh, the scientists need to, to maintain some decorum, uh, and also always keep minds open to what other scientists are saying but that, that specific scenario we've been through that a few times where you have letters on the same day and communications almost with polar opposite uh, 
uh, interpretations, sometimes of the same data, sometimes of different data. Um, and that's why we run so many um, working groups. We have so many virtual groups now. And we try and open and open and open those groups up and maintain the discourse, keep the conversation going, right? Because I think you can reach consensus if people listen. You don't reach consensus if people talk. You reach consensus if people listen. And there's not there's a hell of a lot of problems right now with listening, not the talking. It's the same with the data. It's not the data that's the problem. It's how we use it. It's not the talking that's the problem. It's the listening. This It's 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 so interesting because I, I, I've heard... Um whether it's from Luxembourg with Isabel talking about the challenges of bringing together relatively almost young institutions together and how they collaborate, um, or the different platforms for, for testing, for example, from Sweden, or your, your own message, Mike, about the example, a very powerful example you gave in the first um, the first session about you know, the, the, uh, the achievement was a success in previous eradications was a success in collaboration. We've been talking, this whole session is about data and yet one of the themes all the way through it has been collaboration and mm -hmm. how we can create structures for people to come together. Mm -hmm. So I asked you earlier about what member states should be doing. It sort of sounds as though in this area, so Mike, you're creating it you know, at a national level and Andrea, you're at European level, you're creating platforms for this kind of discourse and engagement. Is this something that member states should be doing? Should they be trying to create these spaces for this kind of discussion and collaboration to try and support these processes? And within, would that help with some of the challenges, do you think? Um, Pro Professor Fahl, actually, I'll, I'll, because I can see you nodding uh, from, from within Sweden. Is that something you, would, you think would be helpful from a national perspective? Yeah, I, I really agree with that. Uh, and I like what Dr. Ryan says about all these um, groups and opening them up and listening to each other that's uh, extremely important we have to enlarge our ears because in sweden there's been a lot of fights on the daily newspapers between scientists and i think that has been confusing the community like why do they disagree all the time and that's how science is but maybe it would be more beneficial to have that discussion in a, a more another setting than in the newspapers so i definitely a... agree it would be fantastic we, we and, and, and I think for us as scientists, we have these, our platforms for disagreement are conferences and journals, and those disagreements typically take years. Mm -hmm. And now we've changed that to having, trying to do that same process in daily newspapers and over days, and that's not a good, so we need, it sort of feels like we need something in the middle. We need, we, we need the kinds of platforms that Mike has been talking about from the WHO process. Um, colleagues, we're in our last two minutes of, uh, of this really very interesting session. Um, I, it, might I ask for um, some any concluding remarks um, that that you um, that you have from? Uh, I, I would go through um, uh, Professor Fall first, uh, just to sort of a ten second, if you had anything, and I'll come through the countries and then to the the European and, and global institutions. I think disease surveillance must be a combination by established methods, but we also need to think outside the box with apps, sewage analysis, and other methods of collecting data. Excellent. Thank you, Professor Tildras. Yes, uh, I, I think it's time to have uh, more comparable data across uh, countries to, in, to formally uh, interact with uh, policymakers and, uh, and guide our decisions. It's not, we don't need uh, research data. We need the data we have, clear, simple data may assist in, uh, in handling this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabel, let's, let's have a go at the connection. Let's see if it's working. Collaboration, Collaboration. yes. <laughs> so again, yes. I think in this situation where we have lack of preparedness, collaboration keeps the center for, the, for success and communication. I think we need to get better for communicating, communicating to our citizenship, to the population, to get something out of the data and to get the data to be useful. Thank you. Coordination, collaboration. I'm going to give the very last word to the ECDC as the conveners of the session. So, um, Mike, I'll just come to you. Great. Now, I would just say that uh, we all speak about epidemiology and epidemics. It comes from the Greek, epidemos, the study of epidemics in people, in demos. And data is the only way we get there. So if we're going to do epidemiology, we have to value what is the 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 the, the ore that that 
that produces the, the the wonderful product which is knowledge of diseases that helps us to save lives uh, and we need to refocus on the value of that data how we use it uh, how we collate it how we share it because that will save lives and that will serve those we need to serve thank you and andrea is the ecdc is the conveners of this fascinating session last word to you yeah, thank you. I think we have now the, the, the unique opportunity to really look into uh, innovative solutions. Um, uh, we shouldn't forget, though, that the technology should serve us and uh, the, the people and uh, that in the end, um, in order to really, really use it properly, um, we have to talk to each other and uh, listen to each other. Perfect note on which to end. Thank you very much indeed. My thanks to um, Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Andrea Ammon, Dr. Isabel de la Fuente, uh, Professor Tsotirios Tsotras and uh, Professor Tuva Fall um, for your excellent contributions to this session, the ECDC again for hosting it and all, all the help from the European Health Forum, Gash Dine colleagues in the background that made a slightly challenging session work very well. Thank you to everybody who took part um, and I hope that you will Enjoy the rest of this very stimulating virtual Gastein Health Forum.